Hi, my name is Paul, and welcome to part five of our six-part series on internationalization and Next.js. If you've been with us for the preceding four videos of this series, you become an expert on managing the processes around IE10N for static content. In the first video, you learned about the absolute basics of internationalization in Next.js, whereas in the second video, we talked about how to choose a third-party library to help you extend your abilities with IE10N in Next.js. Video number three was focused entirely around legal and process issues that you're almost certainly going to run into when growing any project that has an internationalization component to it. Now, we wrapped up the first half of this series identifying a number of outstanding problems that still remained even after everything that you learned in those first three videos. In video number four, we shared a super powerful interface that we created here at Render, which served to solve all of those outstanding problems from the first half of this series and that's whether you're using either human or automated translations. But all of these videos were focused on the static aspects of your website's content. That's why in today's video, we are going to cover an aspect that we haven't even touched on yet, dynamic content. As with anything in the application space, there are many ways to skin that cat. And while we will show you our specific tooling and processes that serve the needs of our business, the point of this video is to show you how we arrived at those specifics so that you can design the processes and tooling that fit your needs. We're going to break this down into a few different topics. Number one will be quick but important, getting your metadata correct. Number two will be a demonstration of our processes and tooling for dynamic internationalized content. And number three, we will share some of the wisdom we've gained along the way to hopefully help you avoid some of the roadblocks we've hit. And number four will be focused specifically around Next.js and how to manage all of this. So let's jump in with number one, getting your metadata right. First thing to know here is that if you have not already double and triple checked your existing metadata, it's definitely wrong, as in there are fundamental problems with it. I would strongly suggest that you pause this video right now, go do that check, verify the current state of your metadata, fix any issues you find, I promise it'll be worth it. That said, there are some metadata attributes that are specific to IETN. Let's take a look at those. The first metadata tags that we are going to want to look at are what will be considered the standard SEO tags, your title and description, any open graph data you may have on your page, if you have a, a nice social card that you want to present to users when the content is shared, which by the way, if you don't have, we have a great video on that subject and how to generate those with Next.js. It's one of the first videos on our channel. Check it out. Okay. So now that we are aware of the tags we want to focus on, we need to make sure that we pass those internationalized values to each of these tags that you've already generated in uh, with your human translation or your automatic translation. Just make sure that you pass those same values to these tags that you would show on the front end of your site. The second one here is going to be the HTML lang tag, which you have, of course, seen previously if you were with us for videos number one and two. If you haven't, what this does is it's just going to tell the browsers and search engines what language the content of the page is in. Number three here is going to be the href lang tag. And I want to share with you a post from the Ahrefs blog. They have a pretty good write-up on this, and I will link this in the description. Okay, the basic structure of this tag is going to include an attribute of rel alternate. You're going to tell it what the language is of the resource that we are linking to. So an example of this might be for the German version of a piece of content, hreflang equals de, as well as the resource that you have made available there. And you would include a similar tag for all of the alternate versions of this content on every page. Okay, now another meta tag that we don't have included in our checklist because it's recommended but not mandatory is the hreflang x default which is basically the version of the content that should be shown if there is not a language variant appropriate to the current user. Now, worth knowing that you can also serve these as headers. You don't have to embed them directly in your document itself. It's also important to get this right in your sitemap. The same Ahrefs post has an example of how to do this properly, so I will leave you with this resource. Okay, number four is actually going to bring us back to this same Ahrefs blog post which mentions the content language. They mention it as an HTML attribute. In our experience, this is a header. So I'll just say the content language header. It's important to know because some search engines look at the hreflang tags 
Uh, Bing says that it is a weak signal and that they rely mostly on the content language HTML attribute, which again, in our experience is a header. So if you send that along with your HTTP response, you're giving as much information to as many sources or to as many consumers of your content as possible. Let's jump into part two of this video, demonstrating our process and tooling. I wanna to start by giving you a peek behind the curtain here at our Strapi dashboard. Strapi is what we use as our CMS. So there's something like WordPress or Payload. Uh, it works really well for us. We decided to use it because their internationalization APIs are just really good. They're really idiomatic. They function the way you would expect for them to. Um, and in our testing, it was great. So we decided to build it, our tooling around this. If you haven't yet chosen a CMS for your project, I'm not gonna say that you should just follow us and use Sanity. It was perfect for our needs because of the way that our team works and what we need out of the system. You should definitely go through the process of evaluating a few of the competing systems. There's Keystone JS, there's Directus, there's Strapi, there's Payload, there's Sanity, there's a ton. Uh, we actually tested all of them pretty extensively to make sure that we were making the right choice, that we understood what we were getting ourselves into. If you are technical, go through the, the documentation of the APIs, make sure you understand what's available, um, actually test the APIs so you understand really that you're going to be using probably pretty uh, at a, an in-depth level for as long as your project is around or at least until you re-platform onto some other system. So it's something that you want to understand pretty well. Okay, so you've published or updated your post and now you want to send this off to Next.js and then in our case to DeepL to be translated. So what do you do? Well, one of the reasons that we chose Strapi is because it has webhooks built in natively. And they were great, they're simple to set up. You go to the webhooks page here, you set up a new one, you point it to the location that it needs to go. You will get a bearer token that you need to have Next.js validate to make sure that not just anybody can send traffic to your webhook and rack up your bill for translations. Then on the Next.js side, you would obviously set up a new root handler that's going to be listening for that webhook that will then process the logic of going and reaching out to, in our case, DeepL and translating all that content. Now, I wanna point you back to this post in Strapi for a moment because I wanna show you one of the fields that we have available, slug. So this is obviously a slugification of the title of the English post, but what do we do on non-English posts? Well, let's take a look. On the German post, this obviously is not the English post. Now, the thing that's worth paying attention to here is that when you want to link by using a locale selector from, let's say, your English to your German post, you can't just interpolate DE instead of EN in your slug value anymore. You have to find a way to actually make your front end, make your locale selector aware of the different URLs of the different versions of your post that you have available. And that can be done many ways. You can either do that as a fetch from within, let's say your top bar or directly within your locale selector that it is aware of the path name and it goes and fetches from your, let's say, Strapi API to get all of those different URLs that it needs to be aware of or all those different slugs that it needs to be aware of. Okay, so we actually opted to store and pass this data across the different components of the website as CSS variables, um, which is what I'm showing you here. This is a client component. It's just gonna go and update uh, the, the locale post URL variable with the value. And then that's basically it. We just update those when we change the fetched URL set from the API. Uh, I wouldn't do that on a client site. I, we just did this because I was curious if it would work and it does and left it because it works. Okay, so hopefully having an idea of how we set up our tooling and why we set it up that way gives you a baseline for your thought process of how you wanna set up the tooling to manage dynamic content in your processes, in your business, or in your project. All right, part three, some wisdom that we have gained along the way. The first thing I wanna share with you is just a little UX cue that I think is helpful. It's hard to put data to, but I'll walk you through what it is. All right, so here's a look at our blog, the same very old post again. And you'll notice that when we go to the German version of this post, we have this little notice here, this little notice here. It basically says that uh, this post was machine translated. So heads up, you know, it may not be completely idiomatic, perfect German. And the point there is just to let users know ahead of time. Um, a lot of times if people are reading content in their language and they can understand that the translation isn't very good, 
they tend to bounce. And so this is where I think there's probably an overall performance benefit for your project if you just let them know, you know, our goal here was to make this content available for you, but it wasn't actually written by a native speaker. For the next one here, I want to take another look at Strapi and walk you through something that you can run into. Now, some languages tend to be very similar. And so what can happen is when you have, you know, Strapi hit your webhook and uh, your logic in your webhook auto translates your title and then turns it into a slug, that slug can actually occur and the exact same value can occur in two languages. That happened to, to us once in Dutch and German, and we had to go and hand edit the post to get it to actually translate and, um, and express that post in Dutch, I think it was. So just something to watch out for and make sure that in your webhook you create logic to check for that case. It's probably going to be pretty rare, but it can happen. Another one to keep in mind is setting limits for your translation costs. Most API tools are going to give you the opportunity to set a limit on, you know, I only want to spend 20 bucks or 5,000 bucks or something um, on translations. And the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you're working in React here if you're building this in Next.js. And if you happen to, let's say, create a render loop and a use effect and you're just hitting that API over and over, your translation expenses can mount up pretty quickly. Um, even if your expense, even if your limit is only 20 bucks, you can burn through that in an instant. So make sure to set those those limits, monitor them, and having an error when you're trying to work on something that you've hit your limit is definitely better than going way over it. So setting something low that you don't really anticipate to exceed in over the course of a normal day in development or something uh, can be a great way to monitor your expenses. Let's move on to part four, getting all this right in the context of Next.js. So for this first point, I want to go back to Strapi here and show you something. As I mentioned, we trigger our translation updates on the basis of the value of this field. So if the value in the English version of this post is newer than the value in any of the non-English versions of these posts, it will trigger an update for that version of that post. It's almost certainly going to be all of them all, all the time, but it does actually check that. So that might not be how you want to run things. You might want to run things so that you are re-updating all of your translation content every week or every month as the quality of these engines that actually perform the translations are improving all the time and probably at least weekly or monthly. That can be worthwhile. Um, you might also have another basis that you want to use for what actually triggers a retranslation, but just make sure that you think through that um, and make it a conscious choice. One last thing here, as this is an XJS project, we'll have to consider whether we want to do the translation updates at build time or at runtime. If you decide to do them at runtime, just keep in mind that there's going to be an ongoing cost to any time a user interacts with a page or, you know, loads your dashboard or whatever. For dynamic content, it's probably going to make sense to translate your content at build time and then cache it somewhere. That will also help you keep an eye on your expenses. All right, that's going to do it for part five of our series on internationalization and Next.js. If you got some value out of this video, drop us a like below, subscribe to make sure you catch part six, and we will see you next time.